Mary Ann Fagan was a 41-year-old devoted mother who lived with her husband, Group Captain Collins Joseph Fagan, who was in the Royal Australian Air Force, and their five children, Anthony, Kathy, Rebecca, Collins Jr., Jack, and Patrick, in the community of Armadale, located in Melbourne, Australia. The Fagans resided at an address on Dandenong Road and had lived there for only a few years, having bought the house in a derelict state before building it into their dream family home. On the morning of Friday, February 17th, 1978, Mary Ann, who was described as quiet and religious, followed her typical routine rising early to prepare breakfast for her children before escorting the four eldest to school. With her husband away on business since the previous day, Mary Ann assumed all household responsibilities until his anticipated return later that afternoon. This included dropping her eldest three children at the train station to catch their respective trains to their Catholic schools, and also driving their six-year-old to primary school in Caulfield, a task she completed around 8.30am in the family's Holden station wagon. Mary Ann then retrieved RAAF allotment money from an ATM, totalling approximately 200 Australian dollars before she returned home at approximately 9.15am, parking the car in its usual spot on the driveway. A short while later, a neighbour observed Mary Ann conversing with four council workmen near her house on the street, who were working on repairing the road after a water pipe had burst. Another witness drove past their residence around 10.30am and spotted Mary Ann in the front yard. Approximately half an hour later, around 11am, Mary Ann's husband called her from the RAAF stores in Tottenham, and the two had a brief conversation before ending the call and continuing with their respective activities. However, this marked the final time anyone had contact with Mary Ann Fagan. It should be noted that during this phone call, Mary Ann voiced her frustrations regarding the workmen and the difficulties she had in parking her car due to the burst water mains and the damage that it had caused to the road. Around 4pm, upon returning home from school, the two eldest daughters, aged 12 and 13 respectively, were met with an unsettling silence enveloping their house. They rang the doorbell but got no response. Their 15-year-old brother arrived home a short time after his sisters, and the youngest school-aged child, six-year-old Jack, was collected from school later that afternoon. The trio sat on the front step, waiting for their mother to appear, having presumed that she was picking up Jack. However, as time passed, they grew concerned. The siblings noticed the side gate to the property was open, a detail that struck them as unusual. Although Mary Ann's car remained parked in the driveway, all of the doors to the house were inexplicably locked. It was then they heard baby Patrick crying hysterically from inside the house. Uncertain as how to proceed, the eldest son contacted their father from a nearby phone box and then resorted to breaking a window to gain entry. Inside, they frantically searched for their mother, but found no trace of her, only the sound of the 17-month-old baby, Patrick, crying in his crib, but fortunately unharmed. As they continued to explore the house, they made a chilling discovery. The lifeless, naked body of their mother, lying face down on a single bed in the front bedroom, a victim of a savage murder. Her ankles and hands were bound behind her back. She had been gagged with a piece of cloth and subjected to multiple stab wounds, approximately 14 according to the Age newspaper who reported on the crime at the time. A blue dress, some undergarments, a stained pillowcase and a Winfield cigarette butt were discovered in the bedroom all of which were collected as evidence by Victorian police upon their arrival at the scene. 
It is worth noting, as reported by True Crime News Weekly, that Mary Ann's hair was in the process of being bleached when she was discovered, with traces of the purple product still evident in her hair. The bowl she had been using to dye her hair was found in the bedroom, along with several cigarettes of her preferred brand. Given that she was in the midst of bleaching her hair, it appears unlikely that Marianne was anticipating any visitors that afternoon. It was stated in one newspaper article that Fagan had been victim to sexual assault, though another article which quoted the coroner stated that she was not a victim of sexual assault. The cause of death was ultimately determined by the coroner to have been a haemorrhage from stab wounds inflicted by person or persons unknown. Several personal items, including Fagan's car keys and house keys, her wallet, checkbook, credit cards, some religious medals and a vibrant red handbag containing the RAAF allotment money she had withdrawn that morning were notably missing from the home and have never been located. A handbag resembling the one stolen from Fagan's home was discovered in a rubbish dump in St Kilda on the night of the murder. However, it was determined not to have belonged to her, ruling out its connection to the crime. Police noted no signs of forced entry, suggesting that Fagan may have willingly admitted her killer into her home, or they forcibly gained entry past her. News outlets at the time reported that police were actively seeking witnesses who may have seen anyone covered in blood in the vicinity between 11am and 4pm. Despite these efforts, no one came forward with any useful information or tips. It was reported, however, that screams were heard in the vicinity between 1pm and 2pm. Newspapers reporting on the case at the time conveyed investigators' beliefs that the perpetrator may have been suffering from a mental illness, possibly schizophrenia, and might not have been aware of their actions on that fateful day. The coroner described the attack as a brutal, vicious and frenzied attack, which left police to believe that only someone mentally unstable could have inflicted such brutal force upon her. However, others dismiss this theory, asserting their belief that the perpetrator killed Marianne in cold blood and knew exactly what they were doing. Authorities drew parallels between this attack and the Easy Street murders that had occurred in the Collingwood suburb of Melbourne just 13 months earlier. In that case, the two young women, Suzanne Armstrong and Susan Bartlett, aged 27 and 28, were found stabbed to death near the front of their residence, while Armstrong's infant son, Gregory, was discovered unharmed in his cot. Interestingly, suspicion fell on the construction workers who were working on a job behind the Easy Street home, mirroring the situation in Mary Ann's case. Despite these chilling similarities, no solid link has been established to suggest that both crimes were perpetrated by the same individual or individuals. At the coroner's court, detectives discussed the interaction between one of the workmen present outside the Fagan residence on the day Mary Ann died, James Robert Jim Scanlon, who was 44 years old at the time. He was reported to have engaged in a, quote, sexual conversation about the mother of five. According to Scanlon's account to the police, he spoke with Fagan around 9.30am after she returned from dropping her children off at school. During this conversation, Mary Ann inquired about the removal of debris from roadworks outside her property so that she could park her car on the curb. Jim then followed Marianne into the backyard to see what she was referring to, and upon his return to the three other workmen, he told them that he gave Marianne a quote for the removal of the debris if the council didn't do it. Upon his return, Scanlon's colleague, Kenneth Ken MacDonald, inquired about Fagin's character, to which Jim described her as, quote, "...not a bad sort, a nice lady, and very attractive." 
He allegedly mentioned to police at one point that he, quote, wanted to knock her off. When asked about his colleague's sexual issues, Jim reportedly told police that Ken had not experienced any sex due to chronic back pain problems. However, during questioning, Scanlon denied telling McDonald that he could assist him in, quote, getting his first one. Scanlon claimed to have left the worksite at the same time as McDonald, around 10.30am, returning at 11.15am, but his testimony was inconsistent, offering four different versions of events. He asserted, quote, I never touched her. I went to the cafe, hotel, SP, horse racing bookmaker, and that's all. He also vouched for his colleagues' whereabouts, stating that they never entered the property. However, questions arose regarding his certainty if he wasn't present. Scanlon's alibi appeared shaky as he claimed to have gone to buy cigarettes while his colleague McDonald was vomiting in an alleyway due to a hangover. Police faced challenges verifying Jim's movements, including his alleged visit to the bookmakers, as his accounts kept changing. At one point, he claimed to have visited the bookies while later denying it. The bookmaker couldn't recall seeing him, and he had been avoiding the place due to debts. He mentioned that the workmen were outside Fagan's home from 12.55 until 2.30pm, potentially during the time of Mary Ann's death. Despite this, they didn't notice anything unusual or hear any screams reported by neighbours. Scanlon went to the pub that night, carrying a significant amount of cash, which police suspected might have been stolen from the Fagan residence, but he denied any involvement. Despite Scanlon's claims of being interrogated for up to 17 hours and threatened with murder charges, he was eventually released without being charged. An ex-girlfriend of his revealed that he had a history of becoming verbally abusive and physically aggressive when intoxicated. However, Scanlon passed away in the 1990s after a fatal accident involving a falling tree. To date, no forensic evidence or DNA analysis has linked Jimmy Scanlon or his colleague Ken McDonald to Mary Ann Fagan's death. According to The Age newspaper, a new suspect emerged in March of 1978, a man wearing an RAAF airman uniform who was observed leaving the Fagan home at approximately 12.10pm on the day of the murder. Despite authorities' first thoughts being Mary Ann's husband, he was ruled out as a suspect, having had a cast iron alibi. Witnesses described the man seen at the residence as approximately 35 years old, 170 centimetres tall, thick set, clean shaven, with mousy coloured hair. His attire appeared rumpled and closely resembled that of an airman in the RAAF. Investigators created a photo fit of the man in hopes that someone would recognise him, but their efforts yielded no results. If the perpetrator was an RAAF airman, it is very likely that due to her husband's connections in the Air Force, Mary Ann would have willingly let them into her home. But without any physical evidence, it's impossible to say who was behind the callous murder of Mary Ann Fagan. Additionally, police appealed to the public for information about the driver of a small green panel van, potentially a Ford Escort, which had been parked outside the Fagan residence for at least an hour after, around 11.30am on February 17th, yet no one came forward with any information. The same applied to the driver of a white Holden sedan parked in Bailey Avenue near the residence on the day in question. During the initial investigation, residents along Dandenong Road were subjected to extensive questioning, as were all four workmen observed conversing with Fagan shortly before her death. Despite thorough inquiries, no arrests or charges have ever been made in connection with the case. Adding to the mystery, the murder weapon used in the crime has never been recovered, leaving investigators baffled and the case unresolved. 
The motive behind this heinous crime has also remained elusive, and several items that disappeared from the Fagan home have never been recovered. Victorian detectives strongly believed that the truth resides within the Armadale community itself, and they are convinced that someone out there possesses knowledge of who perpetrated this despicable act. Over the years, Mary Ann's absence has profoundly impacted her husband and her five children, who have grown up without ever knowing who took their mother from them and why. Their quest for answers has persisted since her disappearance, and they remain hopeful that a fresh appeal will finally bring the truth to light. Unfortunately, their father, Mary Ann's husband, passed away in 2010 without ever knowing the truth about who killed her and why. In April of 1978, a reward of 20,000 Australian dollars was initially offered for information regarding Mary Ann's murder. This reward later increased to 50,000 Australian dollars two months later. Fast forward to February 2024, 46 years after the harrowing crime. The homicide squad of Victoria Police announced a staggering one million Australian dollar reward for any information that could lead to the apprehension and conviction of the assailant. The Director of Public Prosecutions also indicated a willingness to consider providing legal protection against liability for anyone who comes forward to identify an individual involved in the murder. Investigators maintain optimism that with advancements in DNA technology and forensic testing, coupled with the offering of a significant reward, it will encourage individuals with vital information to come forward and assist in resolving the case. On the Chronicle website, Homicide Squad Detective Inspector Dean Thomas reiterated that the smallest piece of information can make the biggest difference when it comes to solving a crime. Anyone with any information regarding the death of Mary Ann Fagan, no matter how insignificant it may seem, are urged to contact Australian Crime Stoppers on 1800 333 000.